will be more of a duet than a single play. I have actually my co-author, uh, Mr. Navi Raju. So first thing which we wanted to say is uh, my journey, as uh, Dr. Nagarajan mentioned. I graduated from here in physics. I went to University of Utah uh, in physics. I was a postdoctoral fellow. And from there, I became an assistant professor looking at the uh, radiation effects in Hiroshima Nagasaki as a physicist. But in that process, I found out that data and technology are extremely important, but how you handle them, the emotional intelligence and the way in which we can represent our technology in a way that it is important became much more critical. Just to make a very small story, we found out that the Hiroshima Nagasaki dose assessment, which was done, uh, I mean, the bombs were dropped in 1947. By the time I went in 1983, the assessment of the radiation dose was not done. Not because the scientific technology was not available, but because the reports that were done by Japanese scientists were not trusted by the Americans. And uh, Japanese were over, let's say, let me not, let me even tone it down. Japanese were really upset that Americans dropped the bomb on Japan and then say, that we don't trust your results. So in some respects, because of the political sensitivity, nobody shared the samples. Japanese didn't give the samples for American scientists to test it out. Americans didn't pay the money that they promised for a Japanese compensation for the victims who went through the atomic bomb. This became a stalemate for 30 years. So when we went in, one of the things which we had to do was, my boss who had a Japanese wife, we went into Hiroshima on a Saturday, Sunday. One of the Japanese professors who took us on a tour to this Hiroshima and Nagasaki gave us some samples, you know, in an in a unofficial way, and we tested them out. And once the test, tests were done and the results were actually validating the results that the Japanese had come up with, then we had to bring all the official scientists and then we had to beg for forgiveness because in some respects we stole the samples. But once we got the Japanese people to agree that we gave you the samples, it is okay, then we had to go to the US government and get a permission from them to say we got the samples from Japanese and their results are valid. Now can you give the compensation? As you notice, in this particular experiment I found out being smart is great, but being wise is not about the experiments that you did, accuracy with which you provided, how good your technique is, but how sensitive you are, appropriate you are in being able to do what needs to get done to make the job. That's what led me to Apple computer later because we were using a lot of technology and in Apple I learned that uh, again user interface. I was a fellow at uh, Apple University for some time looking at future directions and Apple user interface. That is when I interviewed a large number of people and the journey started for me to move from recognizing technology is great. Even now the sophisticated technology is available but use of technology depends on our own emotional intelligence, our own ability to relate to people and similar to entrepreneurs to make a product successful, it is not just about how good is your product, but how much buzz you generate, how well you connect with, and how you take it forward. So many of those are what are captured in this particular book called From Smart to Wise. It is as much my co-authors and my journey as well as what we have learned. It is based on um, what you call large number of interviews. We have interviewed several CEOs from around the world about half of them from India and half of them from the rest of the world. People like Indra Nui, Chris Gopalakrishnan, uh, Ratan Tata, some of them you know already in India. But in uh, United States we looked at Bill Gates kind of people, Steve Jobs, uh, Tim Cook, Alan, Mac I mean, sorry, uh, Alan Malari, John Mackey of Whole Foods and Indra Nui. These are all the various people whose stories are featured in the book. 
So this book features some narratives, some tools, and some questions. That is what the book is about. Just to check, let me see how many of you know other people who are smart. Okay, most of you. Obviously, we are in IIT, so I won't ask you whether you are smart because that would be self-evident already, right? Now, how many of you know somebody who is wise? So some of you know. Let me ask then, if you think about somebody being wise, would you consider yourself wise? How many of you think you are wise? There are a couple of hands. Most of the hands are not up. Can I ask, why would you not put yourself in a wise category? Is it because of age? Is it experience? Is it education? What is it that makes you think you are not wise? If you are having praise your hands. I'm curious. Anybody? Any question? Any answers? Why would you not raise your hand when I ask you, are you wise? What is your characteristic by which you judge yourself your wisdom? Yes, humility. Humility. Okay. That's a good one. Especially from India. What else? What else would you say? Yes, sir. Vijay, you raise the hand in one way or Why would you raise your hand? I would, I would like to feel like that. <laughs> you would like to feel like? Uh, is there a... Be happy and confident. Happy and confident if other people also think that you are wise. Okay. Uh, any other uh, responses? Anybody else? Why? How would you consider somebody wise? Uh, choices that he has made in life. Choices a person has made in life. You make them say that may be wise, wise choices. See, ultimately as students, you have to think about three things. One is, what am I learning? What decisions am I making? What actions am I taking? Is that correct? Whether it's a career, whether it's a job, whether it is entrepreneurship, you need to look at it and say, how do I make decisions? How do I take actions? How do I lead other people? I would ask also add other point because these days it is no longer about yourself. When you become an entrepreneur or as a manager or anywhere else, how do I lead other people? These are three things, right? If these are the three characteristics of personal leadership or professional leadership, then the question is, how do you make decisions? How humble you are? Some of them are actually characteristic. Let me take it to quickly next part. If you look at these guys, would you cast, call them smart? How many of you look at them as smart? Okay, pretty much every hand. How many of you think they are wise? There are a few hands. Why would you call them wise? Can you tell me quickly, quickly say what they are? Can you speak loudly? Why, why would you call them wise? You raise your hands, let us say. Yeah. Doesn't just take smartness to run a company. Okay. What else? <coughs> So not wasting time in the college when they didn't get the value, they went ahead and started the company and make it successful. Yeah, there are several people who did not look at uh, college as a useful investment, but many of us also have found college as a useful investment up to a point. Right? Depends, depending on what you take away. It is not what college offers, it is what we take away. Some people take more, some people take less. Any other comments? In, in, in wasting time in college. Mark Zuckerberg. Let me check here. How about the older generation? We started with the younger ones, Google and Facebook. How about here? This is, by the way, in case you didn't know, Meg Whitman from HP, Bill Gates, Tim Cook and Steve Jobs. Do you call them smart? Okay. How many of you think they are wise? So there are a lot, lot more people. Do you feel experience and age gives wisdom? Why are you guys raising hands about their wisdom? Can you tell me why you think they are wise? Why would you think they are wise? They have demonstrated their skills for a longer period of time. Sustainability of learning and demonstrable capability over time is sign of wisdom. Yes. We are ruling out chance, obviously, because chance can also make it. Dot-com bust at some level, it can do, but 
ability to do it again and again over a period of time. Any other question? Any other response? Yes, sir. Very good question. Reason why I did not give a definition is because uh, working definition. Why did not is because each of us have a certain subconscious, unconscious way we make judgments. Just like I see this, I got to it after saying all of us have to make decisions, have to take actions. If you wait for right definition by somebody else then you will fit according to their model. But if you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to come up with your own definition, working definition, check it out, validate it, and see whether it provides the answers for them, and then take it to the next step. So, especially because many of the students are thinking not just about going for a standard job, but also about creating your own companies and your own jobs, it is important for them to come up with their own definitions and have the self-confidence to follow the path of what decisions, definitions and actions they are taking. That's the reason why I wanted to quickly check that out. So let me take it to the next one. From India, are they smart? Are they wise? Any comments? How about? Last year was <coughs> Excellent. Oh, yeah, last year Anna Hazare was wise. This year he is not. He is out of the race. This is an extremely important point. Wisdom is not a right. You can have it as a degree for the rest of your life. Wise leadership is, a, is, a, is like a dynamic thing. It depends on your actions. Now, it doesn't matter what actions you have taken. Are you taking wise actions on a consistent basis? How about Kiran Bedi? Would you consider her smart or wise? I am sorry? Closer to smart. Closer to smart. You would not even quite call her smart. Interesting. Okay. And each of us have opinions. Each of us have certain ways of looking at the world. You need to honor that. Because you are already smart, you have a certain thing. But you need to figure out how much of it comes from inside, how much of it you learn from outside. Why is that? Because the context is changing so quickly. The world is so complex, you talk about five divas. So the existing models of leadership doesn't work. Top down hierarchy doesn't work. Somebody telling you how to do, what to do, when to do doesn't work. When you graduate from college, when you get out, you need to be able to be prepared to take advantage of the diversity that is there instead of as an impediment, as an advantage. Second, how to connect with people. Like I was talking to some of the entrepreneurs. Some of them were talking about how do I connect with entrepreneurs and investors in Japan or in UK or in Europe or in United States. You need to reach out, take the initiative because the speed with which you act determines the place where you go to and then you can do it with a fixed direction by somebody else's working definition. With the ambiguity of not knowing my own definitions, you will have to figure out how to make it. And finally, you have to do it with no resources, no money, and nothing else. That is when you know you need the Jugad innovation that my colleague talks about quite a bit. This is there is also a lot of research behind it. In 2010, when IBM did 1,700 people uh, CEOs were interviewed around the world, they 80% of them didn't know exactly how to create the future for themselves. The new products new creativity that is required is not exactly something they knew how to control. That depends upon you, right? Who are the new workforce it's going to be in the next few years. Second, employee disengagement has been extremely high. 60% or more are not engaged with work. They don't find the passion, they don't find the purpose, they don't find the meaning. But of course, wise leaders create all of them from themselves. They don't look for organizations to create. Last one, there are lots of challenges from new media and all kinds of movements that challenge the existing business models, how the businesses are run. And finally, out of that, the Global Leadership Report in 2011 says, a productive employee 
versus an average employee, the difference in their quality is like a 13 times. That means if you are excited, if you find meaning, if you are taking initiative, if you do good job, then you are 13 times likely to outperform an average performer. So in some respects, all of you, if you can figure out a way how you can look for being productive, adding more value, taking initiative, not look outside and say, you know, my colleagues are not doing that. Or in engineering job, I don't have to, if they give me a four hour module, if I can finish it in one and a half hour, I can goof off for two and a half hours. That works as long as you think about fitting into what is already there. But if you go out and take up a job, if you can come up with innovative ways to fill that four hour time period, come up with it, your ability to be recognized, rewarded and promoted becomes a lot higher. Only problem is most smart people, you know, essentially rely on the analytical skills and logic. They don't actually use their intuition and their empathy and their own capabilities as much. Not only that, they focus on optimizing what is called a shareholder value. When they become senior executives, they focus a lot more on what drives the business growth, but don't focus on other people. And finally, they excel at managing resources top down, but they are not very good at leading from behind. Now, if you guys talk about social networks, Facebook, LinkedIn, you have all these networks, how do you influence people with whom you don't have any direct control? If you can learn to practice that while you are still in the college, that ability will pay off rich dividends once you go into the job because nobody will manage the career for you. You will have to manage it yourself. You will have to create your own future. And that means you have to take paths which are completely outside and that requires wise leadership. So let me give a working definition which we have for the wise leadership. It is leveraging your smartness for the greater good. It is for the good of somebody else around you, your team, your organization, your project. More you can do for other people, then they will do it for you. Because in this interconnected world, what you can do is very limited. But what other people can do for you is much larger. The second way in which you can do it is, you have to balance your action with reflection and introspection. I know all of you are extraordinarily brilliant to be in IIT and to be in doing what you are doing. The key part is, make sure you take time to learn about your soft skills. Make sure your skills are being refined continuously. Look at your strengths as well as weaknesses and pay attention to finding partners with whom you can work together and together you can actually take it to the next step. And of course, another thing most important is the humility and ethical clarity. Don't do business because you say this is the way everybody does it. Why do you catch me if I do the same mistake? Don't do business as usual and have humility. These are some things that pay off a lot. For being a wise leader, we found out out of all our interviews, we elaborate on the book is, you don't have to be a CEO, you don't have to be a certain age, and wisdom doesn't mean giving up smartness. We are not asking you to become saints and sages, giving up whatever you are you know, aspiring for. It is about leveraging both smart and wise. You know, it, it will not sell, the book will not sell if I say smart and wise. If I say from smart to wise, there is a book for that. That's the reason why we put that book title to be that. But you have to learn when to be smart and when to be wise. So let me ask the last question and then we'll give a framework quickly. How about these guys? How many of you think they are smart? A few of you. How, about, how many of you think they are wise? So some of the points which I am talking about, I hope you are able to get it. The reason why we brought them in as the wise leaders is because they know how to bring their personal side, spiritual side and the business side to come together. That's what we also see as the path to wise leadership. You have to ignite who you are 
your authenticity at the intersection of your work, which is the business, and how you use your technology and tools, what you are learning in IIT, plus who you are as a spiritual self, what gives you meaning, what gives you purpose, what gives you passion. Don't lose all of them. You have to figure out yourself to bring these polarities to, together to make a unique you. That Then you can brand yourself. Then your brand value will go up a lot more. There are two kinds of wisdom. One is a practical wisdom. As uh, Aristotle called it, it is called phronesis. Second is spiritual wisdom. In India, many times we say, there is only one kind of wisdom, that's a religious wisdom or a spiritual wisdom. But in a business, that's not what we are talking about. Why is that important? Because there are two kinds of smartness just like this. The two kinds of smartness, one kind we call it a blue lens we wear. That means people are very good in doing their discipline. If I'm in aeronautics, I will stay in aeronautics. If I'm in fluid dynamics, I'm in that. I'm in software. But there are people, like for example, we have a CEO of Maverick, Rangarit is sitting here, who's actually worked in human resources and leadership development for a long period of time in Aisha Consulting. Somewhere along the path, he found out there is an opportunity to actually provide customer service in a very different, in a technology-based way. And he went and got investment from Arun Jain and some of the other people. He started the company Maverick. He is the CEO of a 300 people company, which is actually part of the IIT network here. So that means he is not focused on his discipline, what he learned in college. He is able to see the opportunities and go. What are the things? Here. Functional smart people focus on operational, whereas business smart person looks at uh, what we call entrepreneurial. As I am going through, you might want to think about it and say, where are you in each of this? Do you focus on how deep I am? Like for example, even Nobel laureates focus on how deep they are. But a few Nobel laureates went out like a John Bardeen. When I was in IIT, uh, you know, Nagarajan was in IIT. When we were there, John Bardeen came and spent three months in IIT. When we interacted with him, he is the one, some of, he encouraged us to go do something outside of our field because he said, if you stay within the field, you will become a field expert. If you go outside the field, you can become a business expert. So, breadth in thinking, vision, whereas execution are a top line. This is what you call bottom line, that is the top line. These people are cautious, they are risk takers. You might want to think about it and say, where do you stay more often? Because if you stay in one domain, to become wise leader, you have to move from there a little bit into the other side. So, you have to figure out where you are and then find a way from one end of the pendulum to move in there. So, our definition of wise leadership is know yourself, look at your strengths, either partner with other people or begin to respect and empathize how to move to the other side. How would you do that? Here is a quick framework which we give. What we are going to do is in this talk, and we will actually just touch upon a couple of them. You will talk, I mean, in the book, each of these six capabilities are six chapters. So we will talk upon about a couple of them. I would recommend you read it. There is a wise leader framework which is free. You can download, you can actually test it out and see where you are. You can download a chapter of the book. You can get some copies at a deep discount today, but these are some six things which are extremely important. One, whatever you do, work with authenticity and appropriateness. And as we move forward, I will just give one example and I will bring uh, Navi to take on and take it wherever. Like for example, Steve Jobs, do you think he is authentic or is he appropriate? Appropriate. Why do you say that? Put it into others. See, my experience, I had a limited experience with Steve Jobs. I mean, even though I was in Apple at different times, I had interactions with him to a certain extent. What I found is, he is a guy who says it as it is. He must have been born in India, right? We pride ourselves, especially IITians. We say, we say it as it is. We don't play politics. 
Is that still how you guys are? When I was growing up, we used to say, we'll just say things directly on their faces. And we just said, this is the way in which it is. We, we are going to be honest and we are going to be blunt. If you don't take it, tough luck, that is your problem. So, I'm sure you have some of those tendencies and some of it might have changed. That is called being authentic, being straightforward. But, he was not always appropriate. People were afraid to get, him, get uh, in the same lift with him because by the time the fourth floor you go in, there are times he fired people. He came to know you and decided you are not good enough to be in our home. So, he is a guy who was very authentic, not always appropriate. So, on the other hand, if I take another person who is now heading up, he was the Tim Cook, is the guy who was behind, he was a functional smart guy. Steve Jobs was a business smart guy. Do you know anything about him? Do you know whether he is authentic or appropriate? Not enough known. Only thing I will say is, as long as he was working for Steve Jobs, he just did whatever Steve Jobs was asking him to do. He didn't care about authenticity. He didn't want to put his name anywhere. Everything was about Steve Jobs. Now he is learning to bring in from his business functional smartness, I mean sorry, functional smartness, he is moving into the middle and he is trying to create his own image and that image to become part of Apple as well. So let me invite uh, Navi to take it forward from there and then you can actually, he can elaborate a little bit more and we will take it to uh, this subject. Chennai to kind of to build on what the Brasal was talking about. So continuing on the framework of uh, for being you know, appropriate and authentic, uh, one of the things I have to confess is that as we wrote this book, Brasal and I, the way we found it kind of being almost like a semi autobiographical in the sense that we were learning to apply some of the stuff that we were writing about. And uh, interestingly, on a personal level, I would say that this is one of the most important principle I'm struggling with myself, which is how do you be authentic and appropriate? Because the term itself sounds like a contradiction, right? Because if you try to be authentic, you can be appropriate. If you try to be appropriate, sometimes you lose the recipe. But sometimes the challenge is how do you integrate both? And there are people, leaders in study, who are actually are able to be both authentic and appropriate. And one of them is Alan Malali, uh, the CEO of Ford, who actually is a straight shooter as well. But he also knows how to under, understand and interpret the changing context and know when it's appropriate to keep, for example, certain brands within Ford that were the cash cows that were killed off too early. And on the other hand, he also realized that the context is changing. And there are times when it's appropriate to let go of certain brands that even though were iconic brands, there are a lot of emotional value attached to them, were no longer yielding enough profit for the company. So he was very smart enough, but also wise enough to understand for example, in the mid-2000 um, period, when that company was doing very well, it proactively mortgaged all the assets of the company, including the logo of the company, to actually get a big loan. And at that time, the economy was doing well, and everybody said, this guy is totally crazy, because why is he actually getting this loan? But his idea was that we need to secure our future. And then when the economic recession happened, as you recall, what happened is that essentially the art tribals of Ford, GM, and Chrysler went bankrupt and had to go back to the government to save them. So in hindsight, and that's something important as well, is that many wise people, when you look at the decisions, they are very counterintuitive in the present moment. It's only in hindsight, 2020, you recognize how wise decisions are. This is a great example of that. So, Another important aspect of wisdom is what they call fortitude, but not any kind of fortitude, like obstinate fortitude, which in the Western world is seen as something heroic, right? Stick to your guns, they say, right? But we call it flexible fortitude or intelligent fortitude. What do you mean by that? Well, if you look at Kiran Mazumdar Shah, many of you know, um, the CMD of the Biocon, she spent nearly eight years developing something that she was extremely passionate about, which is an oral insulin. And when the early trials show that actually this project will not pan out as she expected because of lack of efficacy of this particular uh, you know, uh, drug, she had no qualms to move away from it, despite investing a lot of money. Because her logic was that it was wise to do what is right, which is have this noble purpose to 
find a cure for diabetes. And this was just one mechanism she was hoping would yield through. And when they didn't pan out, she had no qualms to move on. So that's what we mean by intelligent fortitude is not to stick to your guns no matter what, but recognize the context of changing and then move on. And similarly, I think another person who I think demonstrated this kind of flexible fortitude is uh, Mr. Rajan Tata, who again had a very wise perspective to come up with the nano, the most affordable car in the world. And as you recall, what happened is that as they began production uh, in West Bengal, the local government essentially was unwilling to maintain their presence in the state from a manufacturing standpoint. Again, he demonstrated flexible persistence in the sense that he was very determined to produce the nano, but decided to move production overnight from the northwest part, east part of India, to actually Gujarat. So again, that's what we mean by flexible persistence, is that you persist in your effort to come up with this amazing product, but you're flexible in the execution. And interestingly, one of the entrepreneurs you know very well, Reid Hoffman from uh, LinkedIn, the CEO of uh, LinkedIn CEO, he actually uses a similar concept. He calls it flexible persistence, which is a hallmark of great entrepreneurs who stick to the vision, but keep adapting their execution plan. So the next important element of uh, this uh, wisdom framework is uh, S, uh, which is essentially shifting your perspective and finding a noble purpose. And um, if you look at Bill Gates, is a great example of someone who essentially uh, had a very kind of a narrow perspective for many years, in the sense that as long as he was running Microsoft as the co-founder of the company, he was very determined to essentially kill competition. That was kind of you know, his perspective. It was very kind of red in a way. Uh, as Prasad talked about, you know, the different dimension of smartness, he was very much a business smart guy. His logic was he has to be number one in any industry, in any market he plays in, at the expense of competition. And that kind of attitude, in a way, you know, landed him in trouble when in 1998, the DOG essentially filed a lawsuit against him for uh, you know, having a monopoly position in the marketplace. And you can see here, in 1998, he actually appeared in a video conference for a testimonial uh, for the DOJ. That alone, symbolically, showed that actually he was this you know, maverick type, but in the wrong way. And uh, that was the tipping point where, essentially, the public opinion turned against him. And, uh, but then what happened, there's always silver lining in every cloud, something happened in him. Something triggered, something that was a shift in perspective, but he recognized eventually that all the smartness he had was only applied so far to make his company very successful. But he realized that there's something more in life than being number one in a market that we can compete in. So I think, in a way, that was a tipping point around 2000 in field where he began to broaden his perspective, recognize that what if I apply my smartness not to kill competition, but to kill malaria, to eradicate big diseases, or cure some of the worst illnesses in the world. And that's how we ended up setting up the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which today plays a key role in addressing major socioeconomic problems around the world. So the point here is that we think that, in a way, Literally, you can see visually, in a way, uh, the progression or the kind of evolution of uh, you know, uh, Bill Gates from being a smart corporate leader to a wise philanthropist. You can see actually he's much more smiling, he seems much more serene now than this guy on the left hand side there. Uh, and of course, you all heard about Dr. Venkat Swami, uh, affectionately known as Dr. B. Again, someone who found a great noble purpose. Uh, and by setting up the Arabian Eye Care, which today is one of the world's largest eye care uh, facility, uh, dispensing you know, thousands of uh, you know, cataract surgeries uh, every month. And what is fascinating is that one of the important message here is that not only you found a noble purpose, because many of us sometimes, we wake up one morning and say, well, what if I can make a big difference in the world? But you actually acted on that. So again, this is important because what we found is that wisdom is something that is rooted in action. So in a way, actually acted on this noble purpose discovered by founding Arden Eye Care. But more importantly, he was amazing in terms of convincing others to join him in this quest for, as he says, eradicating you know, needless blindness. So another person that I admire most uh, is still very young. He's younger than me. Uh, so again, it belies the fact that you know, age has something to do with wisdom. Uh, my kind of personal hero, uh, among others in India, is uh, B.R. Feroz who was uh, appointed as uh, the youngest, one of the youngest MDs of the multinational in India. He was the CEO of ACT Labs India. And uh, he was somebody who essentially took over uh, ACT Labs and tried to, in a way, impart into their organization a noble purpose, in the sense that rather than saying, like, look, 
we are just developing software to make our clients become more you know, uh, competitive or more successful, he introduced them, their employees, to different visionary leaders, such as um, Abdul Kalam or Kiran Bedi, to get them to understand that you know, even though they are being software programmers, they can make a big difference in the world, and they did. One of the interesting projects they did is called Project Charitra. You may want to check that out, Charitra. And it's actually a portal that allows uh, philanthropic organizations, it's like a kind of matchmaking portal, where if you are a philanthropic organization, you can go post your requirements in terms of resources, where you kind of skills you're looking for, and people who are interested in contributing to it can go and figure that out and then say, hey, I have this particular skill, can I come help you out? So this has become one of the largest portal in India for philanthropic causes. Um, so that's what happened, you know, during his kind of tenure at SAP Labs. The company went from being a company focused primarily developing smart software code to developing wise software applications. Then D is important, that stands for discernment. Um, and one of the interesting things is that um, uh, discernment is very important when you make decisions because in the Western world at least, what we see often is that people rely too much on data and logic, right? Uh, we have a very Cartesian view of looking at the problems and we think about problem solving requires a heavy load of data. But let me show you one example of a leader who didn't rely on data, actually relied on data to show that actually his intuition was valid. Uh, we are talking about Steve Jobs here. Uh, Steve Jobs, for those of you who read his biography uh, by Walter E. Isaacson, um, shows clearly that he actually commissioned a management consultant to find out if opening retail stores would be profitable. The management consultants came back and said, here's a report that clearly shows that that's the stupidest idea I ever heard. Don't do that. Okay? And he got the report, got them from them, and he says, thank you very much for validating my intuition, which is essentially that, yes, I'm going to go ahead and open the stores. Uh, so use the data in a way to validate intuition. And today, thanks to um, that kind of gut kind of uh, decision he made, today the Apple stores are some of the most profitable in the world. Actually, they make more money than Tiffany per square feet. Um, and on the other hand, it's also important sometimes to rely on data when emotions run high in organization. And here is a good example is Sam Pambisano, the former CEO of uh, IBM who when he decided in the early 2000s to actually get rid of the PC business, imagine that, right? IBM is a company that actually founded the entire PC industry. It's like killing your own child in a way. But they have to make the call because clearly his intuition told him that the PC sector was essentially becoming commoditized because of distributed computing with the internet and things like mobile telephony. But of course, a lot of people in the company were very you know, annoyed, angry actually, of this decision. So he actually has to come up with data to actually prove the point that indeed the industry was being destroyed with the advent of the internet, so it's better to move out of this before it's too late. And they did a great decision by selling the company, the PC business, at a very great price to Lenovo. And similarly, they got rid of their hard disk business and chip manufacturing as well, which was a wise decision. Uh, moving on to the O uh, in wisdom, openness to lead from anywhere. Uh, this is very difficult for many of us, including yourself. We are all Taipei's, I guess, in this room. We like to be in the driver's seat. That's what we are taught sometimes to be. But occasionally, it helps to be in the passenger seat um, because that's what is appropriate, maybe again, the word appropriate, right, for the particular context. And the uh, best leaders know when to lead from the front, when to lead from behind. And one organization that trains all employees to be in the, the driver's seat is um, Taj Hotels. We all know what happened uh, in 2008, November, the tragedy that struck um, Taj Mahal Hotel, the flagship hotel of the Taj uh, Hotels group. And Karambi Singh Khan, we interviewed actually for our uh, book, uh, he did something amazing because in a way, he kind of symbolically represent the spirit of the you know, Taj group because he empowered his employees in a way to take initiatives to save the lives of the guests. And without that kind of you know, initiative, many more people would have died during that uh, tragic circumstances. On the other hand, he also demonstrated leadership by being in the front because he actually rushed to save his wife and two daughters who were trapped in the top floor of the hotel, who sadly passed away. Um, and uh, interestingly, I think that this is something that we see most leaders do is that they know when to lead from the front and when to lead from behind. Case in point here again is another leader, Narayana Murthy, 
who again, even though he co-founded the company Infosys in 1982, had no qualms stepping out of the role of the CEO in an orderly fashion when he turned C56. And then he also stepped down from his role as chairman when he became you know, 66. So again, it, it shows again the ability of leaders, especially you entrepreneurs, right? You know that we call that the, you know, the founding CEO syndrome. Entrepreneurs create great companies, but they have trouble sustaining their growth because they're unwilling to step away and let others take over. Um, another problem with a lot of leaders as well is that um, they don't know how to empower employees. And one CEO who I think represents for me the kind of new model leadership, especially for leading your generation, who actually are very much looking for more autonomy in the workplace, is Vinit Nair, right? The CEO of HCL, uh, um, who actually coined this concept of employees first. He actually believed that if I empower employees and give them the freedom of autonomy to do what is right for the company, they will actually do the right thing for the customers. So rather than focusing on customers first, I'm going to focus on making the employees happy to work in my company. And that strategy worked out very well because this company is one of the most competitive in the industry right now. And then comes the linchpin of wisdom, uh, which uh, I think uh, it's not easy, but it's called motivation, which is essentially what drives you, right? When you wake up in the morning, why you want to go to work or run your company, right? What is that motivation? What's the source of your you know, drive? Um, now, most of us, you know, type A types, we are motivated by, you know, personal gains, right? Uh, it's essentially kind of self-interest. Uh, but in our book, we introduce another concept of enlightened self-interest, which is essentially doing what is right for others, because by helping others, indirectly you help yourself. And um, leaders who embody this spirit of enlightened self-interest include people like Ratan Tata, who demonstrated that every day when he was running uh, the Tata Group, or O.P. Bhatt, the former chairman of HPI, who did an amazing job turning around his bank when it was facing a lot of difficulties, by again, like Vinit Nair, empowering his hundreds of thousand employees to take initiative and drive innovation. Um, another leader who studied, we studied very much is uh, PepsiCo's CEO, Indra Nui, who is fundamentally shifting a company's business model from selling essentially what we call junk food, which is you know, soda and chips, to actually begin to produce a lot of healthy items. And many of these healthy products, interestingly, believe it or not, are actually manufactured and designed and developed in India. So India is becoming the new platform for driving this new growth strategy within PepsiCo. And uh, our perspective is that doing the right thing for consumers, which is essentially making them healthier, will also translate in better returns for investment for shareholders as well. So in a nutshell, to conclude, we will say that um, what is the kind of uh, the book is about? The book is about the following, right? Today, most of us, I consider, including myself, you know, we are kind of smart leaders, right? You know, we went all to good schools like IIT. Um, you know, you can take the IQ test. I'm sure they're very high on the chart. Great. But here we are low. Why? Because if you look at most smart leaders, what happens is that the motivation is very much driven by self-interest, right? And it's always about what is it for me? So as a result, it's always like I want to be this bright star, right? In any company I am, in any situation I am. But once these smart leaders, they discover the North Star, which is essentially the noble purpose, what we find is that two things happen. First of all, their motivation shifts. Rather than becoming very selfish or being selfish, they become much more driven by what we call enlightened self-interest, which is how can I bring value to others and the process bring value to myself. And also the perspective gets broader. It shifts as well. And eventually they find a pathway to reach the North Star, either by themselves through their own introspection or with the help of others who can actually provide them that pathway. And as they embark on this pathway, they evolve from being a smart leader to eventually a wise leader. But the journey doesn't begin or stop there. As a matter of fact, what we find is that most wise leaders, as they evolve, they actually internalize that North Star. And as they start radiating that noble purpose, they start attracting others around them as well. And soon what we see is like, like a sun, right? You begin to create the constellation where you attract other people to join you in this journey towards wise leadership. And this is in a way what we see most you know, wise leaders do, is to create what they call the field of wise leadership. So to conclude, we'll say that um, you know, my previous book was Jugad Innovation, where I debunked the myth that uh, ingenuity is something reserved to the elite. We are all born with ingenuity. It's our birthright. And in this book, we demonstrated that actually wisdom is also your birthright. It's something that you're born with. But the question is, how do you cultivate it, right? How do you polish that kind of you know, rough diamond that you're born with? Well, for that, 
we offer certain kind of principles like shifting your perspective, becoming context sensitive, focusing on enlightened self-interest. That's how you can become more productive, effective, and successful. Uh, more importantly, smartness get you here, literally at IIT. Uh, but to go to the next step, beyond IIT, you will need wise leadership. And how do you get ready for it? Well, we recommend that you take first uh, an assessment, a self-assessment, on our website, from smarttowise.com. Uh, and um, we also recommend you to visit our uh, Facebook page and follow our tweets and contribute to our you know, discussion on social media as well. But at this point, what we want to ensure is that we have still some time for Q&A, so I will invite Prasad to join on stage and uh, invite you to join us in a dialogue. So thank you so much, and uh, let's open the floor to questions from you. If questions, comments. Is this useful to you? Can you see why this kind of an approach when you are still a student could be useful as you go forward because you can create entrepreneurial work and get the funding and support much more easily or when you join a job if you can be wise and have the emotional intelligence and empathy up front that will allow you to move much more quickly and much more successfully and finally it comes down to making decisions, taking actions and leveraging the skills that you have that will add value to you personally as well as to what you want to do. So don't make rash decisions in that aspect. Yeah. The uh, whole presentation in the book that you are uh, on smart device, there are no uh, grassroots innovators that you included as per like uh, where we could connect better instead of Connecting to someone who, like, uh, the, the grassroots innovators who have done in a very small scale and how they have done it, how they have went from being smart to being wise. So is what we have not given the grassroots innovators because the primary audience for the book in the beginning was in the big business. So we focused on this. As a matter of fact, we were talking to the publisher and both in here as well as in the United States. We want to get the stories of grassroots innovators. We want to get the stories and case studies of entrepreneurs. We want to create what is called a field book, which will be focused on lots of stories of many of the other people whom you know, and that will be the follow-up book which will come out. Right now, first we laid out the framework with people who are well-known in the industry. That's what we have done. Just actually, in my uh, first book, Jugad Innovation, is actually all about a celebration of you know grassroots innovators. And in a way, uh, if you look at Hari Chande, you know the founder of Selco in uh, Bangalore, who actually offers now uh, solar energy to the poor people, very much he is a wise leader. As a matter of fact, because he's also smart, he has a PhD from University of Massachusetts, but he learned to be wise, and it took him 15 years actually to get to that point where today 200,000 rural households in Karnataka and part of Gujarat benefit from solar energy, so at a very affordable price, and he got the Max AC award in 2011 for doing that. So I completely agree with you, but our kind of uh, ambition, so to speak, is that to kind of democratize, because the social entrepreneurs, in a way, they have this kind of uh, you know, instinctive you know, need for solving a social problem, right? But now the question is for uh, corporations you know, who are designed to serve shareholders, it's much harder to make the shift. So that's why this book, in a way, is kind of a wake-up call for uh, for-profit entities to kind of begin to embody the spirit of grassroots innovators. Uh, so my name is Jitin. I'm a fourth-year student here. So like Jack Welch, uh, in many of his books, proposed a system of uh, boundaryless uh, G. So how will how do you think a leader should behave in a boundaryless system, or uh, how do you think the people should respond to a system like that? What is your opinion? What is your opinion? What is your opinion on a boundaryless system? Yeah, I think the boundary system, let's speak on GE because we had a slide, uh, we, we kind of removed this version. Um, they literally are embodying it, that spirit of boundaryless organization in two levels. One is uh, they are now making more products now out of India, as you know, right? So GE India, for example, is cranking out some amazing products uh, like affordable ECG machines, like the Mac 400, among other things. Uh, that's a recognition that essentially ideas come from all over the world. 
And uh, another way to put it is that all smart people are not located in America, right? And all smart users also are not located in America. So the boundaryless uh, organization, I would say that he is practicing it right now in terms of globalizing the R&D operations. And the other thing they're doing is, uh, it's, a, it's a good question, because uh, two weeks ago, or last week, they made a big partnership with a company called Quirky. Uh, and if you Google, you'll find out. So what they're going to do is that, think about right? Thomas Edison founded uh, GE. And uh, essentially, rather than um, developing inventions and patenting them and keeping all inventions in house, through Quirky, they're going to put a, on the portal, list some of their IP, intellectual property, and then allow entrepreneurs like yourself to log in and say, hey, look, if you give me that particular IP to a licensing agreement, I can take your technology and build a whole company around it. And if I'm commercially successful, well, you get a piece of royalty. So what the wisdom comes there is because G recognized that entrepreneurs like yourself can innovate faster, better, cheaper than themselves in-house. So I think they are definitely practicing that. There are more companies in addition to GE, even PMG, Procter & Gamble, or in any other companies are beginning to do a lot more with um, open innovation and with grassroots innovation and boundaryless approach by recognizing, especially entrepreneurs, many times have to recognize what is needed cannot be invented by themselves. So the not invented here syndrome becomes a major problem and the people have to look at how to partner in a boundaryless way from around the world to make things happen. Any other questions? Anyone ask a smart question, you get two samosas. Wise question, five samosas. That's, that's Whenever we uh, design, there is a kind of chaos in your mind. Uh, there is a chaos in your mind, whether it's right, okay, in the long term, whether it will be right. I mean, because wiseness, we, we may think we are wise, but the resulting action will decide whether it's wise or not. So, how, how we handle that? Like, how, how can you uh, you know that you are acting? The way in which you might want to start is what is the intent? See, many times in India we talk about what is the sankal, what is the intent with which you start. So if you have a clear intent and then you have a larger purpose, which we call like a dhruvtara, you know, in India we talk about dhruv, uh, the, uh, the idea of what is the highest goal that I can achieve. If you can start with that larger purpose, and then come down to what should I do in the short term, it becomes a lot easier. But if you don't have a clear intent and if you don't have a larger purpose, you know, like there is a Chinese proverb, if you don't know where you are going, any road will get you there. It is important, especially when we are students, we try to get tempted by what the others are doing. The peers are doing becomes a lot more. Before you do what everybody else is doing, think about for a little bit and say, where would I like to be five years from now? Where would I like to be ten years from now? It is common practice. I have studied and looked at several IITNs as well as the IIM graduates. What we found out is, especially IIM graduates, first they will look for consulting jobs or the financial industry, Goldman Sachs kind of jobs used to be the ones which they take. After about three years, they will come back and say, you know what, that gave us the money, but we are very dissatisfied. We would like to be entrepreneurs or we would like to go do social venturing or we would like to do something else. Why is that? In the beginning, you did what other people thought is smart for you. Other people thought that will get you the money, name, fame, recognition. But very quickly, especially your generation is finding out that approach is not what you want today. Many of you are actually much wiser than you give credit to yourself is because you are looking at what motivates me, 
what gives me meaning with much more attention than many of us we did in our generation. So I recommend that you pay attention to what will make me happy, what is it that I authentically want to do, what difference I want to do in the world and then look for the job or look for the startup that will move you towards that will give passion, purpose and meaning. That is probably the most spiritual approach you can take into a very practical way. Wise at the end of the journey rather than at the beginning of the journey. The same people at the beginning of the journey, if you ask them, I'm not sure whether they'll say they're all wise people and they're taking the wise routes. So the only ability a youngster can have at the beginning of the journey is partners based on his education and uh, uh, what do you call uh, what is thinking and uh, intelligence. So the wisdom is something we bestow on somebody, Mahatma Gandhi, at the end of the journey, after he has established that we consider him wise. I don't know why, uh, if you ask the same question to most people, what the answer will be, I'm not sure. So I feel wisdom is something which he attached to a person, or person attached to himself. Towards the end of the journey, after he showed the uh, achievement, not necessarily at the start of the journey, I just want to partially address that. I think one of the things, good news for you guys, uh, entrepreneurs, is that uh, yeah, yeah. you heard about the whole kind of uh, agile, you know, development, which is a new approach to developing software. And you heard also about the concept of lean startup. So what's happening now is that you have the approach now of innovation, which is very different in the sense that unlike large companies. You don't have to take months to develop software. You can actually create a quickly some software, put in the marketplace, get rapid feedback. So the point I'm making is that I actually, this is what I'm sure that will build on this as an answer to Prasad, is that you have to think about the notion of time. I mean, it's funny because that's something that I'm passionate lately about it, is that the Western notion of time is very much like, you know, very linear, right? Uh, I develop software, then I test it like crazy, then put in the marketplace, then I wait for feedback. But in Eastern tradition, we view you know, the notion of the time is circular, more cyclical. So that was philosophical for a long time, but now it's becoming practical with the concepts like Lean Startup and Agile methodology, where you can actually get much more rapid feedback loops. And because of that, you have a chance to adapt your action much more faster. Then the question is, what will prevent you from doing that? Well, that's why we talked about the need for having that noble purpose and the ability to have flexible fortitude. Because if you don't have that, and you don't have the right motivation, your action decisions can be adapted on the fly more and more because of the feedback loops. But the willingness to do that depends on what is your motivation and what is your perspective. So, And I will build on what you said. I had interactions with some of the people which we saw. I had interacted with Dalai Lama, Teresa, and all. If you think about it in this way, even in a Hindu mythology, who is one of the person who talks about wisdom? Dakshinamurti. He is considered to be a youth, a 20 year old person. So, Medha, Dakshina, I mean, Medha, Pragna, Dharana. There are three different elements of wisdom are actually in the youth. Somehow, many times we have the wisdom, but somehow that is connected with also innocence. That is called beginner's mind. So, many times I have discovered in research that the conditioning allows you to become smarter and become business savvy with experience, but with the age, wisdom is not guaranteed. So for wisdom, we have to unlearn and selectively forget what has been learned. So I would say, as youth, if you are willing to pay attention to others, if you are willing to look at with a beginner's mind, examine what the customers and other people want <coughs> and you have the ability to pay attention to what's going on outside and ability to learn from what is happening inside so that you have resilience and risk taking and learning from failure. The wisdom which we are talking about, let me separate it out from the spiritual wisdom, the ideal wisdom, what makes a sage, we are not talking about. We are talking about practical wisdom 
that will make you happy while making other people around you happy that will make you reasonably wealthy and successful while you are creating the value creation logic so that you can generate the wealth through your entrepreneurial ventures or intrapreneurial ventures but that kind of a wisdom age sometimes can help if you learn from your own experience or can also become negative if you become bitter that why this didn't happen why that did happen so it is important to recognize the practical wisdom is not dependent on the age we will give a lot more examples in the book but that is what i thought we should touch upon what you raised is a very important point in india especially wisdom is very valued but most of the wisdom we talk about is spiritual wisdom that is not what we are looking for at this moment but first let us figure out how we can take the first step any other question so if there are no more questions we'll just say the six capabilities we've mentioned because this is the first day and where we are we need to also acknowledge we have gotten them from two different sources one is bhagavad gita the 18th chapter when i was here i didn't care about and i didn't pay as much attention to but i went to empirical study in university of michigan exothermic endothermic mesothermic personalities there was a 40000 people study and then i tried to use the framework for my work in the western field because you need empirical data but somewhere along the line one professor b krishnamurthy uh, from he was a mathematician and he was in the birla institute of management he pointed out that the six principles in 18th chapter they talk about gnanam karma karta buddhi druti and sukham these are the ones if you translate it appropriately will be very very powerful and match very clearly with the western framework so in the six capabilities i talked about they touch upon both the spiritual wisdom from india and the empirical side wisdom from the west so when you take the wise leader questionnaire 18 questions you will begin to see in each of the capabilities how operationalizable are you in doing it and where are you on that wise freedom and then you can take it forward so i want to acknowledge that roots that the book which we have is a bridge between western and the indian wisdom and uh, you are the future of india and you are the future of actually not only india because in vietnam indonesia and india these are the three countries which have got more number of people under age 25 so in some respects for most of the western economies western europe united states also future leaders future managers are going to come from india vietnam and indonesia so you need to think about bright future you need to think about diversity how can you be sensitive to creating opportunities and jobs and take up you know entrepreneurial stuff that will work for you and but also works for different cultures if you can keep in mind you will become wise leaders in a much global context not just in the context thank you very much we really appreciate the opportunity and i think the books are available somewhere to buy outside they have some other things and if you want after that we'll be happy to stay for a little bit and then sign the books for you uh, if you got some Exactly, I did it. <laughs> Now that I wrote the book, I better start practicing. Okay.